Hello and welcome. At a time of major global economic uncertainty, we are joined in the national capital by the first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Geeta Gopinath, who's on a visit to India. Thank you very much, Dr. Gopinath, for your time and for joining us for this interaction. The IMF has recently upped the growth forecast for India for this financial year from 6.8 to 7 percent. You seem to be more bullish at this moment than the Ministry of Finance itself. I, I want to understand what is it that you're seeing in the Indian economic story at this moment which has led you to increase the growth projection for this year. Right. Rahul, so firstly, uh, India's growth did much better than we expected the last fiscal year and that those carryover effects are affecting our forecast for this year. The other factor is we see private consumption recovering. Uh, last year, if you looked at private consumption growth, it was around 4%. But we expect that to increase, driven by the recovery in rural consumption. We're already seeing that if you look at two-wheeler sales and if you look at you know, the so-called fast-moving consumer goods sales, you're seeing that coming back up. The better monsoons that have happened, we expect will generate better harvests. And because of that, with agricultural incomes going up, we should see a recovery in rural consumption. So those are the two factors behind our upgrade. And do you see this recovery in consumption because that's really been one of the biggest topics of conversation here that consumption, especially in rural areas, hasn't been growing. Do you see this as being sustainable or just a short-term blip in recovery? Yeah. So last year an important headwind was the weaker monsoons, the weaker crop output and that hitting rural incomes which we was one of the factors that affected consumption in the rural areas. So we see that changing for this year. Now that said, of course, there is the need for more general structural reforms in the economy to bring about higher growth. We have medium-term growth for India at around 6.5%. Now at these numbers, India will remain one of the fastest growing, no, the fastest growing you know, G20 economy in terms of major economies of the world. For example, 7% growth rate for this year would contribute about 17% to global growth. So India is a bright spot in the global economy in terms of its growth rates. But in terms of bringing up overall private consumption and so on, we think some of these factors will play a role. But more generally, structural reforms, which you know, the Prime Minister put a lot of focus on in his Independence Day speech, is going to play So let's important. spend a moment on the structural reforms you think are most important at this time, because there is also a new political reality in India with this government not having a full majority for the growth numbers to rise from the 6.5% that you're projecting over a medium term, what structural reforms do you think the government needs to tackle first, given the uncertain political play out of those reforms when they've been attempted in the past? Right. So there is a whole spectrum of reforms that are needed. Some will take more time to show outcomes than others will. One of the, one of the general factors we see is important for, for example, for investment, private sector investment and corporate investment, is the business environment, the ease of doing business, the ability to handle regulations, and so on, the amount of red tape, that matters. For example, we, had, we did a study which looked at where foreign direct investment was going, and the two bright spots in, in India are Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, and both of them also rank high in terms of business climate. So there's a strong correlation over there. That in implementing that uh, countrywide would be very helpful. Labor reforms are important. So we have, India has the new labor codes. This question of implementation, uh, that is still an ongoing process. It will require regulation at the central level, but also incentivizing the state governments to uh, implement the labor codes. That's again something that can be done in the near term. Public infrastructure investment, digital infrastructure investment, that's a lot's been done, but a lot more is still of course needed. And, and that's another area. Trade restrictions we think is important. I mean, this is actually a, a, a going to be a decade of opportunity for India. The world is looking to diversify, looking for other markets to sell to, but also importantly other markets to buy from. And India presents that opportunity. You see a huge amount of interest in India right now. So uh, you know, the only way you're going to get that is if you're also going to be seen as being trade friendly, because that's usually the path to getting into global supply chains. So these are some of the near-term ones. The more longer-term reforms, of course, are education, skilling. That's going to take time. Land reforms, including clear land titles, agricultural sector reforms. You know, all of these will take time, but can't emphasize enough the importance of human capital and skilling. The skill mismatch is still very large in India. Changing that is going to be very important. You spoke of keeping trade tariffs low, uh, given that globally we're seeing a 
push back against globalization and countries putting up their own protectionist barriers. What do you make of the current set of schemes and policies like production and linked incentives that the government has to trying to bring manufacturing into India? The concern is whether that links India adequately with global supply chains. Do you think India is missing a trick over there? What would, you, what would your policy recommendations be? I think mean, the government is right to focus on some of the important areas and the, you know, the, there's the production linked, linked incentives and the recent budget had employment linked incentives which is another area that requires attention but the question is of course is oh, you know how what kind of results it will deliver we're seeing countries around the world now eager to use policies to stimulate certain sectors in their economy if you go by history since it's not the first time this has been tried it's been tried in the past if you go by history you know those things have tended to be fiscally quite costly and not necessarily terribly effective. So it's important to do the cost-benefit analysis. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done, but do the cost-benefit analysis and see what the outcomes are. But more broadly, just stepping back, we are concerned about a general environment of trade protectionism that's developing in the world. Uh, and this is something that we are you know, cautioning against, just given what we know of how beneficial trade has been in terms of reducing poverty uh, in terms of maintaining growth rates and technology transfers and so on. Let's spend a moment on employment linked incentives which Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman introduced in this budget. Do you see ELIs as being an adequate uh, device or a, you know, as a positive step in trying to deal with the central issue of job creation? So again it's identifying the problem that really needs to be addressed in terms of creating more uh, employment and more jobs being created. It's still early to figure out what the impact of it is going to be, but you know the pieces of it concept looks interesting, but we're going to have to wait and see. We think coupling that with these other reforms, for example, what I talked about in terms of implementing the new labor codes that are there, because that provides more have flexibility in the labor globally? market, that can help. Have employment-linked incentives, it's very specific to the country, and it depends upon how it's being used and where it's being implemented. So, uh, you know, there's no... Countries put very different policies in place. I don't know if there's an exact match to what's being put in India right now. Uh, but again, what we know in terms of job creation and, and employment is in addition to measures of this kind is to have just basic structural reforms, improving business climate, raising corporate private investment, uh, labor market flexibility, land reforms, and so on. Given the scale of job creation that's needed, so we crunch some numbers, and if you look at what's needed between now and 2030 is anywhere between, cumulatively, between 60 million and 148 million additional jobs. Right? That scale of job creation will require a wide, big push. And I know there's this big debate going on whether we should be manufacturing focused or services focused or high tech focused. Given the scale of job creation that's needed, it's going to require everything. So having the right business environment, right, right investment climate, the right kind of human capital, right kind of health of the workers, all of that is going to be critical. It's going to require a big bang on multiple fronts. Prime Minister Modi has been speaking again and again about his vision of trying to make India an advanced economy by 2047, what he calls Amrit Kal and his vision of a Viksit Bharat, a developed India. On the back of the policies that you're seeing at play and the growth trajectory that you're seeing in, in front of you on the horizon, do you think India is on path currently to be an advanced economy by 2047? So firstly, again, I just want to emphasize that India is doing extremely well in terms of its growth rate. At 7%, it is the fastest growing major economy in the world. And being able to keep that up, which is what we expect it will do, 6.5%, I mean, that is a, a large accomplishment. Now, 2047 is a very long ways out. I think we can look at some intermediate targets around the way, along the way. We expect by 2027, India could be the third largest uh, economy in the world based on our growth projections. 27, not 28 or 29. Based on our current projections, 2027 uh, is when we expect that that could, ha that could happen. But what happens all the way in another, you know, several, uh, several more years later, of course, that's, you know, that's a long run. Now, we have to keep in mind that most middle-income countries have not graduated into advanced economy status, the so-called middle-income trap, where that doesn't happen. Uh, but it takes, it's the countries that keep up with persistent structural reforms on multiple fronts and graduating not just from at some point where it is more of, you know, using techniques that exist 
to moving to being more innovation-driven economies, making that transition happen too. It takes all of that to get to being an advanced economy. There are small exceptions like South Korea and Singapore that have accomplished that. India can certainly, uh, you know, work towards that uh, goal, but it's going to require a huge movement on multiple fronts. One of the big challenges with India's economic growth is the specter of growing income inequality. The fact that the rich are getting richer, uh, the poor are getting poorer. How do you think the Indian state and the Indian government should really be trying to tackle that challenge? So firstly, I mean, growth in India has helped a very large spectrum of people in India. I mean, poverty rates over the last decade have come down by a whole lot. So it has lifted a large number of people uh, in the country. Now, there is there is the question of the different levels of growth that you're seeing in their incomes, and frankly, better data would help in that front. We just we've been looking at it. It's hard to pin a story over there. What we do see is unevenness. There are some parts doing better than the others. The higher income, urban, do better. Rural, uh, doing uh, not as not as well, uh, and so. You know, that is an area where certainly more attention can be given, and the government is doing that, and we saw that in the, in the budget uh, measures, too, that have been taken. But again, how do you bring that around? I think there is the, the same set of factors I explained to you before, which is in terms of the near term versus the longer term, right? In terms of the longer term, better human capital, better skill mis uh, match with the kinds of jobs that are going to be created for the future. That's going to be absolutely critical, raising productivity in agriculture so that the workers move out of agriculture into the newer sectors is going to be absolutely uh, important. So these kinds of broad-based reforms will be, will be critical. One of the big concerns is the specter of India getting caught in the middle-income trap, $8,000 per capita, and you're not able to rise your population above that. And the fact is that India has such a big population that it's also a highly likely scenario. Uh, how concerned are you about this possibility that, okay, you're talking about an advanced economy, but the very real fear is that you could just get stuck like a lot of other countries in the middle income trap? Right. Firstly, I think if India can keep up growth at 7 8% for the next decade, you know, let's set aside the question of whether that gets you to advanced economy status or not, but that itself would be a, a big accomplishment. So, you know, everything along the way matters as much as getting to an advanced economy status. If you can get to an upper middle-income uh, country status. In, along the way, of course, that would be fantastic. So, I'm, you know, I think we should, uh, you know, I think it's great, we should absolutely aspire for 2047 and the target that's been set there. But along the way, it would be very impressive if India keeps its growth rate up. We don't see that in many countries around the world right now where growth is slowing in many places. If you look at global growth as a whole, it is, it's, you know, our projections for the medium term is the weakest it's been in decades. And many countries who were hit with all the headwinds in the last few years didn't really recover that well. India has done well. So it, you know, I think one should take some, some strength from that. How are you looking at what's happening in Bangladesh at this moment? Bangladesh has, for a few years, been one of the bright economic spots in South Asia, or at least from the outside it seemed like that. And now suddenly there's massive political tumult. How do you think Bangladesh should navigate? How do you think Bangladesh's economy should navigate this tumultuous political transition. Yeah, so firstly, I want to recognize the you know, really terrible human suffering that's happened over there in terms of loss of lives. We're working very close with Bangladesh. As you know, we have a program with Bangladesh. We've been, uh, we are in close contact with them. We are absolutely committed to working with the new government, the interim government first, uh, and then, of course, whoever comes to power. Assessing what the impact of all of this is going to be for the economy, it's a bit early. I don't have a number for you. You know, in Bangladesh trades with India, there's likely to be some trade disruptions, but in terms of spillovers to India, we don't really see that as a uh, major factor. How concerned are you about the possibility of the United States, given the unemployment numbers that just came out, slipping into a recession? Our baseline is for, remains that the U.S. will have a soft landing. That is our baseline projection. You saw the re most recent retails data, retail sales data, which shows that there is still plenty of strength in U.S., consumption. We're seeing inflation coming back down. Uh, the Fed is clearly being data dependent, but you, you hear of talk of cutting of rates. So we're not in the recession. Uh, we, don't, we don't see, you know, our, 
our baseline is for a soft landing and not for any recession. And finally, the big X factor in global growth is the potential outcome of the presidential race in the United States between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. How do you see that impact the U.S. economy and global growth? So, as you know, I will not talk about any political uh, elections or outcomes, but what we do see is election, when you have elections, which are good to have, is that you do have some uncertainty around what kinds of policies that will happen next, and you, that affects markets. You can see that in, in the volatility of markets in some cases. So it is what it gives you right now is the uncertainty around it. Of course, when the election results are out, we know what the policies are. You're here for an uh, event at the Delhi School of Economics, which was your alma mater. Uh, how special a moment is this for you to come back uh, you know, when, when the institute, India's most pedigreed economic institute, is celebrating a big moment? And as one of the S-star students, what does this mean to you personally outside of all the economic rhetorics? Oh, well, first of all, it's wonderful to be back and, and especially to... This is a great moment for Delhi School of Economics, 75 years. It's my honor to, have, to be a part of their celebrations and really, truly, I mean... That's where I learned my economics. It's where I am. It's what I'm using uh, for, for my job and for all the jobs that I've done so far. So I'm very thankful to the School of Economics and to India for that. Well, we wish you all the best. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great trip. Thank you. Thank you. 